the title of my presentation is What does making make other than making? Please say that ten times. It's very difficult because I've already tried. <laughs> um, so I'm Kat. I'm finishing up a PhD at the University of Sussex down in Brighton. And I'm from London slash Vancouver. And I live in Oxford, just to confuse things. Um, and this is my first time in Liverpool, so I'm really happy to be here today. Um, it's also an honor to be here today because I was once myself a full-time self-identified maker. Um, and I worked with emerging maker communities around the world at organizations like Mozilla and um, the Open Knowledge Foundation building open technologies online that would empower them in different ways. Um, so I have a lot of respect for those of you who, who are making things you know, full-time that matter in the world. Um, but when I started research as a social scientist three years ago, I realized I was no longer preoccupied by the things that people make, but instead by the ways that making itself changes the way people think, and by virtue of that, the very fabric of our society. And this is where you, as makers, who are also producers and small business owners and innovators, really come in. So I want to argue today that you are doing something very important that warrants further contemplation. Um, and so I'll use the next 10 minutes to explain why. So the title of this presentation has been inspired by James Ferguson's book here, The Anti-Politics Machine, which critiques the failures of the field of national development in the 1990s. He took issue with, the, with its assumption that it brought about any kind of economic stability and decided to look at the non-economic functions that it served instead. Here he found it had become an anti-politics machine by making blatantly ideological decisions about the allocation of resources in lower income nations while maintaining its discourse that these, these decisions were merely technical solutions to technical problems. So now I'm going to show you three examples of the ways that making is changing society. And then I'm going to ask you a question that I think is quite important in your work because it regards the nature of your work and the outcomes it too produces, both intended and unintended. So my first example is about museums. There's a bit of a theme today. Uh, my PhD research focuses on the ways that collections maker spaces as they're calling them, or public spaces for making and learning with cultural collections inside museums, are increasingly being used by institutions across the UK to create new kinds of relationships between artifacts, staff, and visitors. So I've spent the last few years working with staff and users at four sites like this, at the Tate, at the British Museum, and the Welcome Collection, to build an understanding of their experiences, because these are the first sites um, in, in that city that have occurred. So I found that because they are questioning conventions of culture, ownership, and privilege through their practices, that they are in many cases activating critical inquiry into the ways museums themselves function, and also their hegemony, um, which is changing people's perceptions of culture through the things that they make in those rooms. So my second example looks at these uh, community technology networks. Uh, the social scientist Adrian Smith has researched the legacy of these very early sites for making in the UK, which were introduced by the Greater London Council in the 1980s under a labor um, administration as a series of open workshop spaces that would develop socially productive ideas to harness peer production and small scale manufacturing. Each site was managed by a coalition of neighborhood groups, schools, and trade unions, and their members worked together to prototype a variety of local alternatives to market-oriented approaches to innovation, from small-scale wind turbines to children's play equipment. They also registered all their designs in a product bank at each site that was open to anyone in the community who wanted to use it. Uh, most of these technology networks were shut down when the GLC itself was abolished in 1986 by Gesu Thatcher, uh, but the participatory design methods that they introduced to get people involved in their neighborhoods can still be seen today across both private and public sector in the UK because they help change people's understandings, both of society and of their own potential. So my third example focuses on the ways that making is changing the national economy of China. Uh, earlier this year, I joined a British Council delegation that Gemma mentioned earlier of makers and academics to explore local maker cultures in two middle tier cities in China, Chengdu and Xi'an. Uh, we looked at over 30 different kinds of sites for digital making and craft, uh, from high-tech robot factories and university innovation hubs to tr very traditional tra um, craft-based villages for city tourists who wanted rural and hands-on experiences. And we learned that China is in an especially transformative moment because making as a form of entrepreneurship 
has become a core focus of economic development for both national and local governments. In 2015, a series of policies were introduced that emphasized the importance of making as a way to transform the next generation of Chinese young people, i.e. program them, into design thinkers and entrepreneurs in order to address future worries of them being employed. So this means that making has come to be seen by the Chinese people we spoke to not as a creative or artistic hobby the way it is here, but instead as very good business, which has caused over 7,500 subsidized maker spaces to be opened across the country. That's more than anywhere else in the world. And the government plans to open 10,000 of these sites by 2020. So I use these three examples because in each case, making is changing our world just a little bit. So if making can be this powerful not only as a market force, but also as a social force, something that creates not only new things, but also new subjectivities for those who engage with those things, how can we enable a future where people are not only more economically productive, like we're talking about today in many cases, but also more creative, more socially engaged, and more empowered to make a change themselves? Uh, for example, I bet some of you are producing new ways of thinking in those that use your products. Uh, make things in your space or engage in, in your workshops. <coughs> and maybe some of you are helping others engage in the possibilities of new models of production, as some of you mentioned today. Maybe some of you are helping others engage in the possibilities of a new kind of economics, a new way of living, a new kind of education, or a new mode of government. But what I would like to know is what are the politics stated and unstated behind the things that you guys are doing. So my point here is that by thinking carefully about the byproducts of the products that we, as makers, are bringing into the world, we can ensure that making too does not become an anti-politics machine. I'd even go so far as to say that every single one of you in this room today is making something other than that which you are making and which you say you are making. So the question is, what? That's it. <laughs>